Hi everybody, I'm Lawrence, and today I'm going to talk about how you can go from knowing very little or nothing about machine learning to seeing how it works for a computer vision scenario. There's so much discussion about machine learning, and with so much information out there, it can get very confusing. So I want to boil it down to some of the essentials to show you how it all works. And then maybe that will help you get started on the road to being an ML developer. It's actually much easier than you might think. So let's take a look at traditional software development for a moment, but label some of the artifacts. For example, you've likely seen code like this, where you read in some data, you perform some manipulations on the data, and then you return the result. That's what the software industry was built on. Or maybe code like this in a game where you want to determine the behavior of the game, how to move the ball, what happens when it collides with a brick or the wall, etc., etc. So traditional programming could be summarized in a graph like this. You express rules using code, these act on data, and you get back answers. Think about almost every computer programming problem and how it could be summarized like this. It's what we've been doing for our whole careers. The machine learning revolution is just a new way of looking at this graph, because it's a new and different methodology for coding. Instead of trying to figure out the rules ourselves and express them in code, what if we gave the answers and the data and then we have a computer figure out what the rules are. And that's the core of the entire machine learning revolution. I know this might not make a lot of sense right now, so let's explore an example. Consider activity recognition. You want to write an app that uses sensors on a phone or a watch or something else to determine a person's activity. You could, for example, use the data of their speed and then write a rule that determines if the speed is below a certain amount, then they're walking. You have data, you have a rule, you get an answer. And then you could extend this to determine if they're running by a new rule. If it's below four, they're walking, otherwise they're running. Well, great, it still works. And you could extend this even further to see if they're biking. If the speed is below four, they're walking, otherwise if it's below 12, they're running, otherwise we can say that they're biking. But then how would you handle golfing? What rule could you write to determine that they're playing golf? Also, by now, you've probably realized that the other rules are also that little bit naive. You can't just go by speed. You might run downhill faster than your bike uphill, for example. And of course, different people go at different paces. So let's go back to this diagram and think about how machine learning could solve that problem. We can't figure out the rules for golfing, and our rules for the others were already a little bit naive. So maybe we can use ML. What if we give it answers and data and then have a computer figure out what the rules are? So for example, it could look like this. We could consider that all of the sensors on our devices and grab the data from them when we're doing the activity, and that will give us data. And we could then label that data based on the activity with something like walking, running, biking, or golfing. Now our problem becomes, can we match this data to this label, like here? For example, maybe these parts are always present like this when the person's walking. And these values are always different when we're running, biking, or golfing. Can we have a machine spot those patterns? And when it does spot them, can we then use whatever rules it figured out to determine which patterns match which labels, and then have that look at future data to determine what activity we're performing? And that's probably more reliable than if we wrote the rules ourselves. So how do we write a program to do that pattern matching? The process is actually quite simple. We'll start by making a guess as to the relationship between the data and the labels. Then we'll look over all of our data and compare our guesses with the correct answers. We'll have those answers already when we label the data. Then Based on the parameters of our guess and the accuracy of what we got by measuring against the real answers, we have some data that will let us optimize our guess. And then we repeat the process. Logically, if we keep doing this, our guesses will get better and better. When using the tools of machine learning like TensorFlow, the APIs to handle this are available for you. So now, if we go back to this diagram, the idea behind machine learning is to feed in the answers, also called labels, and the data, and then have the machine figure out the rules that match those labels to that data. And when you do this, you'll get a model. The model can then take data and apply the patterns that it learned to match that data to answers to give out a prediction or an inference about that data. 
So in our case of activity detection, now someone else could take a device and based on the pattern matching rules that the machine learned and put into the model, it could detect if you're walking, biking, running, or even golfing. So let's put this idea of pattern matching into practice. And we'll explore how it can be used in computer vision, where we use the concept of machine learning to help a computer understand the contents of an image. When you give an image to a computer, it's just a bunch of pixels. It doesn't really know anything about its contents. So to simulate that, here's an image. I've blurred it, so you probably don't know what it is. With images, you can apply filters to extract information. Now, you've probably seen tools like Photoshop or Instagram where you can sharpen images or detect edges and stuff like that. Those are just filters, which are just sets of numbers. So what would happen, for example, if I could apply a filter to this image that does this and detects these things? Now, to you and me, they look like human legs. And then maybe another filter detects these things. And again, to you and me, they look like human hands, but the computer has no idea. It just knows that it has detected something. And then maybe another filter detects this. And again, to us, it looks like a human face. So by applying these filters, I can get legs and hands and a face. And if I had already labeled the image that works with these filters as a human, I can have a computer learn that when it detects these three features using filters, then what it sees in the image is a human. And similarly, if other filters detect things that look like these, then when the computer applies those filters to an image and all three of them produce something, it's labeled as a horse. So over time, in the same way as with activity recognition from earlier, if the computer can figure out which filters extract the features that determine the difference between the answer of a human and the answer of a horse, then we begin to get a set of rules that determine the difference between a horse and a human. And then in the future, if we pass it a new image, depending on which filters work with it, we can predict what's in the image. These filters are randomly initialized, but over time, using the loop that we showed earlier, their values can be measured for accuracy and then optimized and so on. The values that match data to labels can be learned over time. So when we pass data into the model, we can get inferences out, and we have a model which contains the learned filters, and in the future, if we pass it an image, it can detect the features that, for example, determine if the picture contains a horse or a human, and in this case, it's clearly a human. So remember this loop. We make a guess, we measure the accuracy of that guess, and we then optimize for the next guess, repeating this across all of our data a number of times. In the case of computer vision, our guess is to randomly initialize the values of the filters, apply them to all images, and then try to determine which ones work to extract features that get matched to the labels. Then we can compare the results of our guesses and their matching with the actual labels to see just how good or how bad our guesses were. And then we use the data from this to tweak our set of filters or any other parameters to improve the accuracy. And we repeat. So for example, if my filters look like this and I'm extracting features and I can reliably match these to a label such as human, then in the future, when using these filters, I can confidently predict that the image contains a human. And in fact, it does, like we can see here. So what does this look like in code? In TensorFlow, we can define a model as a number of layers where each layer is a piece of functionality and it defines what we want the machine to learn. Conv2D stands for convolution2D, which is another word for filter. And because this is quite a sophisticated scenario with detailed images, applying filters to the image probably isn't enough. We have to apply filters to the image and then filter those results and then filter those results again, which is why there are three layers of filters. In between these layers are things called max pooling, which while they aren't necessary, they are really useful. Max pooling is a technique that compresses the image while maintaining the results of the filter. This means the next filters will have less pixels to work with, but they'll still have the features, and this can speed things up when you're processing lots of images. After you have all of the filters learned, then the idea is to match the filters to the labels 
and a dense neural network does that really effectively. So the results of all the filtered images, things that I demonstrated like legs, hands, and head, will be matched to the labels so that those extracted features will be matched to the relevant label. So human-looking legs get matched to human, horse-looking legs get matched to horse, and so on. The last thing is the output of the model, and it's defined here. And this is also a neuron. As we only have two types of class here, horse or human, we can actually do it with a single neuron, where if the value is closer to zero, it's likely to be a horse, or if the value is closer to one, it's likely to be a human. Once the model is defined, then we have to define how it works in training. So if we remember this diagram, make a guess, measure accuracy, optimize, it's done in this code. First of all, when we define the model, all of the parameters, the filters, the values of the neurons, all of that stuff was randomly initialized. And that gives us our first guess, in other words. As we only have two classes, horses and humans, a randomly initialized model should be expected to be 50% accurate or thereabouts. So we can measure that accuracy using something called a loss function. Now there's tons of built-in loss functions in TensorFlow, so it becomes a matter of choosing the right one for your model in your scenario. I chose one here called binary cross entropy because I only have two classes, binary two. The next step is to then optimize your guess. And in this case, we're optimizing using a technique called root mean square propagation or RMS prop. And again, you have a number of different options. It depends on your scenario to choose the, op the correct optimizer for you. The optimizer will take the data that it has, the random initialization of the parameters in the network, the accuracy and all that, and then update all of the values with a new guess. And we then repeat. We started with close to 50%, but now because of what we've gathered, the next iteration, for example, might go up to 60%. Remember, this is what gives machine learning its name. By going through this process, it's learning the parameters that best match the data to the labels. The next piece of code is called model.fit. And it has that name because it's fitting the answers to the labels in order to figure out the rules. And the epochs parameter, this defines how many times you'll repeat this process. As the model gets better and better at matching the data to the labels, the process convergence is used. It takes time to figure out how many epochs, what model architecture, what parameters, etc., will lead to convergence, and a skilled machine learning developer should be able to reach convergence quite quickly. So let's now give a demo of training a computer to recognize horses or humans. We'll do this in TensorFlow. Okay, so let's take a look at the horse versus human in action. I have a collab here, and I'm going to start just by making sure TensorFlow is running within it. It's connecting to the VM, and it works. Now I'm going to download the data. I've stored the data in Google Cloud Storage, and it takes just a few seconds to download it. First is the horse or human, and then is the validation data. The data is zip files, so I'm just going to create local directories that I can unzip them into and I'm good to go. I'm going to import TensorFlow, and now I'm going to create my model. And my model is a convolutional neural network, as you can see here, a pretty straightforward and simple one. I'll just define that. There are multiple layers of convolutions, and as you can see, there are four of them. Now I'm going to compile the model. I'll just compile it using root mean square prop as the optimizer and binary cross entropy, because there's only two classes as the loss function. This code will import the data using an image data generator, and it will do the image augmentation that we discussed, setting things like the rotation range, the width shift range, and so on. And now here I'm going to fit the model. I'm just going to train it for 15 epochs, so it's pretty short, and I'll speed it up. And now if we scroll down, we'll see that it's done. The 15 epochs have run, and it's got about 86% accuracy on the training and about 88% accuracy on the validation set. So it doesn't look like it's overfitting. And we can run the model just to give it a try. So if I run this code, it will give me a box where I can choose my files. I have some files that I downloaded. This one called human, where you can guess it's probably a human. And it saves it, and it checks it out, and it sees, yes, indeed, that was a human. And if I just try one more, and I choose my files, and I pick one of my validation images, which is a horse, and we can see horse here, and it actually correctly classifies it as a horse. 
So that's it. That's the horse or human model and uh, that we showed here and just shows how quickly and easily you can get up with computer vision. And indeed, this model is actually quite a difficult one because training the differences between horses and humans is, uh, it can be a very difficult problem to do. And TensorFlow is able to solve it in this case. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can reach me on Twitter at El Moroni. <laughs>